movement of people is an unprecedented global challenge. With us now to discuss the refugee crisis and his new project is none other than the world-renowned artist and filmmaker himself, Ai Weiwei. Welcome to all of it. Thank you for being here. Thank you for letting me be in your station. It's, it's absolutely our pleasure. I want to start by going back a couple of years and talking about the film, Human Flow, which preceded your new book. Were you drawn to depicting the refugee crisis on the screen because in your travels around the world you saw this growing unprecedented problem or is it also because of your background as a political dissident in your native country of China and that uh, enabled you to relate to the refugee experience in general? Well, the year I was born, which is 1937, my father got exiled. He, uh, he was a poet, and uh, he being sent to very remote the, uh, area, Xinjiang, and uh, uh, stayed there for 20 years as, uh, in the labor camp for re-education. So I was born in 1957, and uh, right after my, my birth, I stayed with him and grew up in, in this very remote area. So I never really realized I'm a, you know, a refugee to my own nation. I only think, uh, you know, it's, uh, they, don't, they don't have the words as a refugee. So, uh, but it is a displacement and, uh, and, and being pushed away from your home. So I would say I have that uh, uh, experience since I was born. But by 2015, I gained my passport to travel. And uh, before that, I was in self-detention. So I, I come to Berlin and, uh, and experience uh, some uh, related issues in, uh, in global refugee uh, situation, Syrian war and, uh, and uh, the people moved out from uh, uh, Syrian and, and Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, and uh, you know, many, many places. So I started to pay attention. The reason I got involved is I really want to learn more about the global politics. And uh, this is a very important lesson for me to, to, to see how uh, this uh, um, refugee situation are being taken by Europe and the global um, polit political situation. You saw that Europe was not addressing this situation in, in a way that you felt uh, kept in, in the spirit of human rights and with, you, you didn't see Europe accepting these people in a way that, that, that you would have hoped they would. I, uh, yes, uh, it was a surprise. I remember the first one I went to Lesbos with my son, who at that time was only seven, six, seven years old. On the seashore, we start to see people uh, from the ocean come out uh, on a dinghy boat, and the women, children climb out. That that image stays in my mind, and uh, that that gave me a a shock, you know, because they are approaching Lesbos, which is a beautiful uh, island since a uh, great time, and uh, a great time. So I see people come up, uh, come up out from the boat, but basically nobody received them. They stayed on the shore or they sleep on the street. And uh, there's no help from Europe. And uh, that is unbelievable. This was your, this was your first full length feature documentary. Have documentaries become one of your preferred creative forms? It seems to me that you can reach a wider breadth of people and, and also tell a more global story than through maybe just an exhibit in, in one city. 
Yeah, I have a lot of uh, uh, RP exhibitions facing very different audience. A documentary uh, have a real human individuals, families, real stories from uh, you know just uh, observing them and document document their story, and it's it's so important to to get to know them. And listen to how they uh, would uh, how they telling you their stories, and what really uh, that's what is humanity about. You know, we talk about the humanity or human rights, and uh, very often it's just empty words. But when the uh, a mom, grandma, or uh, a lady hold a cat during the uh, the whole escape. Then you realize we all the same. You know, we we all uh, we just in very different situation, but we all the same. Yeah, I, I mean, I I felt bad watching your film just in in looking at some of the refugees from Syria. You know, backpacks, t-shirts, jeans, baseball caps. They could be. You know, young people anywhere, anywhere on the globe, um, and I, I think that comes through quite dramatically on in the documentary. But then you you decided to take what you had, I guess, left over on the cutting room floor, some of it at least, to publish the interviews that you had done with refugees and others in in this book. Um, did, did putting these interviews into print allow for something that the the moving image did not? First, we have a thousand hours of uh, uh, in, uh, footage, and there's over 600 interviews. Um, uh, it's about 23 nations and four, uh, four different <coughs> huge camps. So, in in a film two hours long, you only can put very little in there, and that would be complete a waste. So, I decided to make a book. And book functions very differently. People can read it with their own reading habit, and uh, people can imagine it. And also, they, they can stop any place they want to. And then, uh, you know, they, they can open the book from uh, one chapter, and uh, there's no connections to the next page, probably, because it's very different uh, uh, refugees or or the people involved in refugee situations has been interviewed. So I think reading is a very different uh, act from watching a film. In, interspersed in the text, though, are also these black and white photographs that you took. How were they chosen, and how did you hope that they would supplement the written word? Well, the, the, the images... Uh, uh, during the whole uh, journey, I filmed the thousands, uh, thousands of you know tens of thousands of images. So it's not difficult for me to choose uh, some images, and uh, and uh, I just filmed them with my iPhone. You know, today iPhone has all, uh, such high quality, and uh, so that makes sure uh, every image. Is uh, is a real condition and they always uh, uh, have some relations to the the topic. If you're just joining us, you're listening to all of it. I'm Matt Katz, and we're talking to Ai Weiwei, the world-renowned artist and filmmaker, whose new book is titled "Human Flow: Stories from the Global Refugee Crisis." I'm curious about about your process here. The Interviews were conducted in 2016, and they're laid out chronologically in the book. But sometimes the interview dates are, are close together. They're, they may be just days apart, but you'll have traveled from Germany to, to Thailand, for example. Did you show up in refugee, camp, uh, refugee camps, for example, find whoever you could to interview um, uh, just on the spot? Or did your crew identify some possible participants for interviews beforehand? So you could move on to other places quickly. Um, in each location, twenty-three nations and uh, maybe hundreds of locations, we all have a fixer, and uh, those people uh, uh, can can come from uh, 
UNHCR and also come from some kind of local non-profit organizations. So they know uh, a lot of people. So we, we it saves us, us a lot of time. But still we also uh, interview the people we, we demand to interview. And uh, you know, uh, so most of them uh, would respond uh, to us and uh, some are not respond or refuse. Uh, interviews, but uh, we try to get uh, as much as possible. You said there were some people you demand to interview. I imagine those are the, the, the politicians, some of the employees at the refugee camps. Um, but those are who you're referring to, right? I mean, you, you seem like you wanted well, to not just talk to refugees, but also people in positions of power. Yeah, like, uh, like uh, German uh, has uh, over a million refugees from the from the you know the that time. So we try to get in touch with the top officials in Germany. Of course, nobody wants to answer us. And also, we, we also tried in in Israel. You know, we want to hear their stories, but uh, also nobody answered. But uh, otherwise, most locations. Also, we did uh, in Myanmar. And, uh, you know, not easy to get uh, uh, any kind of response sure. from all. Yeah. But uh, uh, refugees always like to talk. And also NGOs like to talk. <laughs> right. Was, was there a, a common theme that came up again and again in your interviews, regardless of the ethnicity of the refugee, regardless of the, the part of the globe that you were in? Yeah, they all, two things are uh, always come uh, uh, very similar, is they all been forced out. None of them want to leave their home, and doesn't matter how poor or how, uh, and how lacking of the life support, but none of them are really willing to leave their home. They all been pushed out. And most of them, they want to go back because their language, their religion, and their living uh, style is uh, it's very different. Uh, they, they cannot easily to be integrated in uh, so modern society. I've done some reporting on, on refugees and what I've in, in different countries, and what I've found is that there is such an inconsistent approach to refugee protections. Uh, within countries and from one country to the next, even though there are these international refugee agreements that are signed by most countries on earth. I mean, gang violence and climate change, for example, are huge drivers of the refugee crisis here in the US, but uh, the Trump administration doesn't provide asylum to, to people who uh, might have come over because of those reasons. I'm wondering what you see as the political solution to the refugee crisis. The, the international agreements, as you get to a little bit in the book, um, aren't really followed in the, in the way that they were intended. Uh, do you think that there's a solution here, international law, country, should countries be making their own laws here? Yeah. What, what are your I, thoughts? I, I think we need a, a universal uh, agreement. You know, the refugees are not become refugees by themselves. You know, there's a regional conflicts, a war, or a famine, or, you know, or mishandling, um, you know, an environment problems. So I think whoever violates this uh, has to bear the consequence, you know, has to be punished. Otherwise, uh, uh, you know, this ha uh, human tragedy can never really be stopped. Hmm. So, so you think countries should be forced, really, to take in anybody who comes in and has a credible uh, claim of, of, of persecution or fear of returning home for whatever I, reason that, that might be? I think the refugees are individuals who, who need protection, <coughs> and that they have absolute right to, to, to stay in, in a safe place. And uh, I think uh, to just push them into the ocean is inhuman and is violate uh, uh, law, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's not moral. 
and uh, so that has to be, uh, you know, has to be solved. You know, we cannot just do that. In uh, in Lesbos, Greece, you interview someone who works for the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, who talks about the importance of acknowledging that so many of these people are, are refugees and not migrants. Uh, and and I think by migrants, that, that really means economic migrants, people who supposedly are just coming to get to get a you know to get work. Can you explain why this distinction is so critical when we think about this issue between refugees and, and just you know migrants? Well, a lot of times the distinction is very, very blurred, but uh, the politicians normally say, oh, hey, we just want a better life. But, uh, but is that uh, a good reason? Or is that uh, 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 can be a reason we refuse the people to want to be a, a, a better life, such as uh, a place have a freedom of speech or or democracy, or you know, or have better, uh, you know, uh, better protected in many ways, because in the future there will be a lot of refugees from uh, clim climate change. You know, people just simply cannot have survive. So yes, they were immigrants. You know, they they want their children to be uh, have better opportunity, and but. Uh, you know, during the globalization, and uh, there's so many poor people who are being created by by this uh, capital cooperative uh, machine. So I think uh, the rich nation has the responsibility to 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 help, and uh, there's no excuse for that. If you're just joining us, I'm Matt Katz. You're listening to All of It, and we're speaking with Ai Weiwei, the world-renowned artist and filmmaker who has a new book, Human Flow, Stories from the Global Refugee Crisis. Ai Weiwei, I want to ask a, a, a larger question, if I could, and it just it, it kind of circulated in the back of my mind as I was reading these interviews. What What are your thoughts on on borders in general, This I th these, these lines? between nation states, uh, some of which, many of which were created by war, some of which were created arbitrarily through the years by those in power. Um, d did you have a uh, changing view of them as you crossed borders yourself to interview people who were struggling to find protection on one side of a line or another? Well, borders is very complicated, you know, uh, in Europe, in the in the past, uh, not too long ago, they have uh, uh, wars in between Europe, European nations. Of course, there's the borders and there's different uh, religion or different uh, groups or or uh, different uh, interests uh, or just culture. They they kill each other. They have a territory. But now we talk about the modern days, those borders, you have open borders between some nations in Europe, and maybe all the nations uh, in the EU have open borders. So, but still, there's a uh, very different condition uh, in, because uh, basically Europe is uh, about the same life, uh, um, you know, modern life. But even it's different culture. But uh, in many, many other um, continents or, or different locations, uh, people are living very differently. And uh, with different culture and language, many, if there's a no war, people love what their own way, you know, they, yeah. the border is okay, you know, but only when there is a conflict that, uh, that force them to, make a choice. So the best thing is um, to, to make the, the, their own choice they, if they want to have border or, or to, to have their ter territory, which is fine. But yeah. not to put them in a condition they have to choose. Then that, then that, is, that is their own rights to, to, to choose where they want to live. Much of the hardship that you saw happened on these borders. You were in 
uh, Calais, France, uh, where there are there were refugees kind of amassed at the border who were trying to get to Britain. And there you interviewed a police officer who was in charge of patrolling the, this kind of refugee, makeshift refugee camp there. What was the most challenging part for you uh, interviewing people who might contribute to the hardships that the refugees are experiencing? I mean, these were police that are, that are, that are uh, pol they're policing these people who are seeking safety. Um, was, was that difficult uh, to interview somebody on that side of things? I, I don't think that's uh, difficult because they're just doing the job. You know, the, uh, the political decision are decided by someone else. And uh, so they, they are doing their job, you know, so. So, so you, understand, you, you, you understand, you're empathetic to their experience as well? Yes, they're, they're just tools of the, the, the other interests, you know, the, the political interests or, or some more powerful uh, people make decisions. And uh, the, so, so the border control and the, the policemen, they're just tools. Yeah. They are no different from the fences, uh, uh, you know, Trump is building between Mexico and the U.S. Right, right. They're, they're, they're a function of the, the, the politicians' policies, I guess, right? Yeah. I understand you've been working on a film specifically about the Rohingya uh, refugee crisis. Um, does, how does that film relate to human flow and, and will it, where uh, are you in that process? Yeah, we, we already finished the film, but we are still waiting a moment to release it. I think we will soon release the Rohingya film. And uh, since uh, basically our, we made uh, three refugee films, uh, one is Human Flow, second called it The Rest, which is talking about the refugees already um, come to the Europe, on the land of Europe, what, what, what they are facing. And the third one is the Rohingyas which is the refugees from Bang, uh, from Myanmar and are now settled in Bangladesh. So the Rohingyas is a very special group. They are, they are stateless people. They never had a home. And uh, they have been uh, so badly hurt by Myanmar uh, government and uh, police and army. And uh, so, but they're like a community. They're more like a whole village or <coughs> town has been pushed out. So they have very different uh, uh, life. You can see clearly they, they have very different kind of settlement. They build their own tents and uh, they have their own community. It's, it's a very interesting situation. Do you imagine yourself continuing to tell these stories of, of refugees and as long as the world is, isn't, isn't listening as closely as you, as you hope they were? I don't think uh, in general the world is, is indifferent to, to other people's uh, suffering or, and, or, and the pain. This is a, this is a the fact, you know, and uh, we lost the the, the uh, 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 we are not capable in, in uh, to share compassion or to even pay attention to the unfortunate people. That is the fact. And uh, that uh, shows uh, our human conditions today. Yeah, yeah. And I know that you've already released a, a another film this year and it's about Wuhan during the lockdown there called Coronation. Uh, you directed and produced this film remotely, which is remarkable. I'm curious before I let you go, what has this year been like for you as an artist whose work is so focused on human rights and, and being out there uh, in the world? Um, have you been driven to make more work and has it been Difficult to do it given the, the the isolation and the quarantine that many of us are forced to live under. I think um, as an individual or a human being, or you can call it artist or a filmmaker, we are 
we bear some kind of responsibility to humanity. And we have to protect the very essential rights through aesthetic uh, sculpture, painting, installation, or through uh, uh, moving pictures, or, you know, or a print the matter, uh, book, and, uh, you know, uh, by any means necessary to protect the uh, human dignity. Ai Weiwei's new book is titled Human Flow, Stories from the Global Refugee Crisis. Ai Weiwei, thank you so much for being here on all of it, and, and thank you for sharing all of these stories with us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Up next, an update on the latest COVID guidelines and school reopening news with WNYC planning editor Kate Hines and education reporter Jessica Gould. And we want to hear from you, parents. In-person learning is set to expand for younger kids. If your child is in elementary school, are you sending them in? Parents of older kids, how is this sitting with you? Teachers, how do you feel about Sunday's announcement? Students, no one ever asks you, so we will. What do you think? Call us at 646-435-7280. Support for WNYC comes from the Museum of the City of New York's new gallery dedicated to the Stettheimer Dollhouse up close, featuring rare miniature original artworks by Marcel Duchamp, Gaston Lachaise, and more. Now on view, time tickets at mcny.org. Dancing Deer Baking Company, delivering artisan handcrafted cookies and fudge brownies to the client's door for over 22 years. Dancing Deer Baking Company. No matter the distance, we got you covered. More at dancingdeer.com. M-Train, a workplace culture and compliance training platform. M-Train helps organizations weave ethics, respect, and inclusion into their culture to strengthen the social fabric of their workforce. Learn more at mtrain.com. Listener support is powerful, and when you support WNYC, you make a statement that stands for truth and accountability, for bringing people together, and for the power of independent journalism. I'm Tanzina Vega, host of The Takeaway, and today is Giving Tuesday, a global day of giving back. <laughs> We're making a charitable day. Support WNYC now. Call 888 wnyc or visit WNYC.org. to all of it. I'm Matt Katz, filling in for Allison Stewart. Every Tuesday, we're joined by WNYC's planning editor, Kate Hines, for our weekly segment, Kate Has a Plan. Hi there, Kate. Hi there, Matt. How you doing? Doing good. And with news over the weekend that the city's public elementary schools would reopen on December 7th, we're also joined by WNYC's education reporter, Jessica Gould. Hi, Jessica. Hi. Hi, it's good to be together again, all three of us. <laughs> yes, it's very exciting. Together, somewhat virtually, but together, yes. And listeners, we want to be with you as well. We'll be taking your calls about the school's announcement. So parents, we want to hear from you. If your child is in elementary school, how does this weekend's announcement affect you and your kids? If you have an older kid in school, do you want the reopening policy expanded to include middle and high schools? Teachers, students, how do you feel about this announcement? Give us a call. 646-435-7280, that's 646-435-7280, or you can tweet us uh, at allofitwnyc, or send us a message on Instagram, also our handle, allofitwnyc. So, um, just to stand by for a second, we want to get some news from Kate and get a little overview on the COVID situation. So. I, I heard a little bit about this this morning, Kate. Uh, apparently there was some breaking news. The New York City Health Commissioner announced that everyone older than 65 with underlying conditions should stay home at this point. And this is just guidance, right? Right, this is just guidance. And it's anyone who's over the age of 65 or has underlying health conditions um, to take precautions like limit activities outside your home, you know, except unless you really need to, to travel to work or school or for essential purposes like doctor's appointments or getting groceries. And it, you know, and right after that press conference, Governor Cuomo held a press conference in which he, you know, reiterated, this is an advisory. It's not like people who are 65 or have type two diabetes are trapped in their homes and not allowed to go outside. It's a recommendation similar to what happened in the spring when we had the first go-around with COVID. Right. 
And I, I imagine this might affect my, my parents' daily walks through Central Park, but I have a feeling that they'll still, they'll still get outside, if not uh, limit other activities, I imagine. And like everything else, people are just going to, they'll make their own judgment calls. Um, you know, we get some guidance from government, but sometimes it seems so contradictory. We just have to make our own decisions with our families. Yeah, Did, contradictory and changing. And I just want to say, you know, yeah. like there's, it's, the guidance says, if you go outside, maintain at least six feet of distance from other people and wear a mask. Um, it's, you know, it, I, it's up to interpretation how much you want to follow this guidance. There are obviously mental health considerations. Um, I'm personally thinking of re-upping my request to my mother that I do her grocery shopping which, for her, which is something we did at the start of the pandemic. And by July, I think she was fed up with the produce I was picking for her and <laughs> she picked it up again. But um, the recommendations also suggest that people who live in households with other people like this abide by these, gui these guidelines too. So this is, you know, it's, it's a big deal. It's something to really yeah. take into consideration. And what about the possibility of another pause like we had in March? I mean, are Cuomo, de Blasio talking about that? No, no one. I mean, it's it's on the table in the way that anything is on the table at any time. But the thing that really s stuck out to me yesterday when Cuomo um, had another COVID, update, COVID briefing for the media was he talked about how we're definitely experiencing an increase in some parts of the state. It's worse than others, like Western New York, Buffalo and Rochester. Those are the hot spots in New York State right now. And he's doing things like managing the hospital load. Um, he wants to make sure hospitals don't become overwhelmed and that this is something we really need to think about. <laughs> My mother just texted me and said, I'm listening oh, to you God. and the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> Mom, I'm going to Trader Joe's for you, too bad. Um, but he's, you know, so he's talking about managing the hospital load, but not doing things that some epidemiologists have said we really need to do, like, you know, close gyms and really crack down on indoor dining. But, you know, my overwhelming sense from listening to months of, you know, of the governor and recently in the past couple of weeks is that he's really, now we've transitioned to we're holding out for the vaccine. His press conferences are now all about the vaccine and the resources that it's going to take to distribute the vaccine in New York State. That we just have to get through this next period of time, which is going to be a really, it's going to be a really tough winter. There were a lot of graphics yesterday with the Grinch, you know, on his PowerPoint. And the Grinch is COVID now. But we are, you know, do what you can do. Take personal responsibility. Limit your large gatherings indoors, but hang on to the vaccine. So it's kind of, you know, it's kind of surprising. Uh, speaking speaking of the Grinch, the MTA, uh, they are apparently considering raising fares up to 4% next year. This is all obviously amid drops in ridership and then broader economic collapse. Virtual hearings begin on this tonight. What What's the outlook here? Is this going to happen? Is this still penciled in? What's the story? I don't know. If, I mean, it would be astonishing to me if it didn't happen. There's definitely going to be some type of fare increase because the MTA has built like biannual fare increases into its budget for a long time now. And it's kind of <coughs> gotten the population used to that by increasing mm -hmm. fares every two years as opposed to what it used to previously do, which is like, we'll try not to do it because nobody likes it and then we'll do it when we need to do it. But it means we have to raise them, you know, like 25% of people don't like that a lot. Um, having said that, you know, it's no surprise to anyone that ridership right now is 30% of what it once was, and the MTA gets a huge chunk of its revenue from ticket sales, you know, it's something like 40 or 50%. So it has seen its revenue just, you know, go plunge. It's been really yeah. dramatic, and they're losing hundreds of millions of dollars a week. Um, and they've been pretty clear, like, we are facing a financial cliff. If we do not get federal money and a lot of federal money, like billions and billions of dollars of federal money, um, we're not only looking at a fair increase, we're looking at huge service cutbacks. And I just saw, um, this is the story of transit agencies around the country. Like Washington DC's Metro is like, yeah, you like your weekend service? It might go away because we're really financially strapped. So it's really, it's scary. Um, so the fair hike hearings are hearings in which the public can go and tell MTA board members and staff what it would mean for them to see an increase in, you know, the cost of a ride. 
usually they're held in person. They have to hold, you know, they have to hold X number of hearings. Anytime a transit agency or something like the Port Authority does this, you it has to be done publicly. You have to be able to take public input. So they're being held on Zoom right now. The first one will be tonight at 5:30. Um, transportation reporter Stephen Nesson is going to be monitoring it, so we'll bring you some of that, the voices that we hear at those fair hearings either later tonight on WNYC or tomorrow morning. Very good. And I am contractually obligated to ask you uh, about <laughs> another piece of uh, news, and that's avian news. What's going on with the birds? What is going on with the birds? I'm really bitter right now because I didn't. I wanted to sign up for a New Jersey Audubon trip in mid-December. That's called Harlequin Romance, in which I was like, they're basically guaranteeing you the spotting of a harlequin duck, which is something I've never seen and I really wanted to see. And I went to sign up last night and it was full. So I'm, I'm just bitter about birds right now. But um, there, the great horned owl is still reliably seen in Central Park, which is very exciting, as are the two barred owls in Manhattan. Right, right, very good. All right, good, that's, that's some good bird news, excellent. <laughs> um, Kate, thanks for these updates. If you can, stick around, we're gonna take some calls when we bring on Jessica to talk about the schools. If you're able to stick around, maybe talk to our callers, that'd be great. I'd love to. Um, we're gonna take a quick break. I'm speaking with WNYC planning editor and uh, Kate Hines and reporter Jessica Gould. I'm Matt Katz filling in for Allison Stewart. And we are taking your calls at 646-435-7280 about the schools and reopenings. We will continue our conversation right after a break. Stay with us. WNYC is supported by Mohawk Mountain House, presenting Hudson Valley Getaway, Sunday through Thursday this winter. Packages include two or three meals daily, guided hiking, wellness sessions, and more. Mohonk.com. Rothman Orthopedics. Their new Midtown office is accessible by multiple forms of transportation to all of Manhattan. Now open at 645 Madison Avenue. Learn more at RothmanNY.com. The Virtual Other Israel Film Festival, presented by the Marley Meyerson JCC Manhattan. An in-depth look into Israeli and Palestinian societies through films and conversations, December 3rd through 10th. More at otherisrael.org. Listener support is powerful. When you support WNYC, you make a statement that stands for truth and accountability, for bringing people together, for the power of independent journalism. Today is Giving Tuesday, a global day of giving back. Please consider making a charitable donation to support WNYC right now. Call 888-376-WNYC or visit WNYC.org. And thanks. WNYC, independent journalism in the public interest. 93.9 FM and AM820, NPR News and the New York Conversation. Listening to all of it with Allison Stewart, I'm Matt Katz, filling in for the day. We are continuing our conversation about COVID and the local effects and restrictions, and with news over the weekend that the city's public elementary schools would reopen on December 7th, we knew we needed to talk to WNYC's education reporter, Jessica Gould. So Jessica's here with us, and Jessica, now all the public school parents out there might be feeling a little whiplash. Public schools were closed for in-person learning on November 19th, 10 days later. Mayor de Blasio announced that starting next Monday, schools would, re would open for elementary school kids who had opted for blended learning. And then on Thursday, December 10th, uh, students in District 75 uh, for, for students with disabilities would start as well. So give us the, the global picture here. What do we know about how many kids will likely be back in school in the, in the next couple of weeks? Yeah, so it's about 190,000 students, as you mentioned, in pre-K through fifth grade, and then students with kind of complex disabilities in District 75 that can start coming back next week. That is one-fifth, about one-fifth of the total school system, so the vast majority of students are still going to be doing remote learning, at least for now. <coughs> Got it. And, and, how, and, and who has opted into the, this hybrid learning model? Do we know anything about that population of kids? Yeah, we don't have the most recent numbers since the opt-in period um, when, you know, about 35,000 more families opted into in-person learning. This was just as the mayor was uh, saying he might have to close down the system. So it was a 
confusing time to be uh, raising your hand to go back in person, but about 30,000 families did. And we don't have the, dem the total demographics of that group, but we know that anecdotally and demographically, we're aware that about um, disproportionately white families are taking advantage of in-person learning. And that's in a school system that is overwhelmingly composed of students of color. So increasing in-person learning does tend to benefit the white families who have disproportionately opted for that more. Hmm. And then what do we know about the plans to have students uh, actually attend school five days a week going forward? Uh, the, the mayor indicated something about that. Yeah, he said that's a goal. And he said things like, you know, most schools will be able to offer five days. That's not what I'm hearing so far. I think it's a real mix. There are some schools that have had few enough students uh, want to come in person that they can increase to every day. And there are definitely schools where that's the case. But there are a lot of schools that can't make that work because of their staffing or their space constraints because you still have to social distance. And so um, I've heard from some principals who are frustrated because the mayor has made that sound like that's what families are largely going to be getting. And mm -hmm. in, in some cases, that's, that's really not going to happen. Let's uh, go to the phones. Janet is a teacher in the New York City Public Schools, and she has some she has some concerns, to say the least, I think. Hi, Janet. Hi. Um, I want to echo um, what the, the uh, reporter just said. Uh, it seems to me that um, by what um, Mayor de Blasio said was that most but not all students, um, the elementary school students, would be able to go five days a week. Um, I'm a teacher at an elementary school. I know other teachers at several other elementary schools. And our experience is that they're all in cohorts because of the social distancing. So they had to break up into smaller groups in order to um, maintain the CDC guidelines. So we're doing all we can to teach as many students as we can, as often as we can. However, it's not five days a week and it couldn't be. That's why we had to go to the cohort. Um, and that's the case in most schools, at least the ones I know about. Um, so I think parents are going to be disappointed at best um, if they expect five days a week and probably angry uh, about finding out that five days a week is just uh, like this dreamscape. It's not really reality. Hmm. Thanks, thanks, Janet. Jessica, our, how are parents reacting? How are well, we heard from a teacher here, and she was talking about how parents are going to be quite angry. What, what's the reaction you're hearing? Well, from parents who were lobbying fiercely for schools to reopen as soon as the mayor shut them down a week and a half ago, this is a victory, and they're very happy. Um, and they want their kids to be going as often as possible. Um, I have heard from parents who are frustrated because the mayor said five days a week is a likely option and it's not for them. Um, I've also heard from parents who say that they would have opted into in-person learning if they knew that it was gonna be five days a week. Uh, but I think still the majority of parents have opted for remote because they think that's safest. And I'm not sure how much this whole drama <laughs> of reopening, closing and reopening in-person affects the vast majority of parents out there. Parents, if you're available, give us a call, 646-435-7280. Tell us, tell us what you think about, about these plans and the shifting plans. Let's go back to the, uh, the phones. Hi, Charlotte. You there, Charlotte? Hi, yes. Hi, hello. How are you? Doing well, thanks. This thanks is for exciting coming. for me. I, I listen to you guys like every day on my lunch break, so this is pretty exciting. Hi, well, um, it's exciting to hear from you. So, um, I am a public elementary school teacher. I teach in East Harlem, and so I'm home right now remote uh, after last week, which November 19th actually happens to be my birthday, great birthday present. Um, but I feel like all of these changes are what they, what, what kind of what de Blasio is saying, and what, they, and what all teachers and what all people know is that, of course, it's so important for children to be in school. If they do their best learning in school, we all know that. But also these constant changes of back and forth are also very disruptive for a child's social emotional development, along with teachers. 
Um, and I feel like this is a real rush to go back, especially with the winter break approaching. We don't really know what the effects of the Thanksgiving holiday are going to have on the COVID rates. And the other thing that's really not being talked about in all of the statistics and all of the science is, you know, yes, maybe it doesn't affect students and children as much, which I'm also not so sure about um, because I have a student myself who um, is sick with COVID right now. Um, but also teachers have not been really mentioned. The fact that teachers are putting their lives out there and we're all on public transportation commuting to get to school. So whether it be two or three days a week or five days, which again, like the caller before said, is not possible at my school. It just feels like not everything is really being thought about and considered. And of course, I want kids to have the best learning experience possible, but I also want everyone to stay safe and healthy. Sure. Did you say your, your child that has COVID, is, is he or she okay? Um, I have a student, yeah. He's, he's okay, but he's not, it's, he's, yeah, a student um, who, he's okay, but he does have some symptoms. And it's, yeah. you know, it's, so it's not, you know, no one is, the thing is no one is really fully safe. Did you feel no, like the you, yeah, and you're concerned about the health of, and the well-being of teachers? Do you feel like the the union is properly sticking up for you at, at this point? Yes, yes, and no. I think everyone has their hands tied. Um, I feel like it's always going to be somebody else's fault and someone else that you go to to place of blame. Um, and that, you know, the, the truth is no one really has the answers, but I feel like there is a lot of negotiating going on. I think that a lot has been done by the union to support us, but there's always more that can be done. Um, 